Masters Tournament, Augusta, Georgia, 1986. A whole bunch of little things happened. Jack Nicholas. Jack Nicholas. Yes. Jack Nicholas was my dad's hero. Three birdies in a row for Nicholas. My skills were starting to erode probably in my 40s, but I wanted to win anytime I played. Kind of all came together. The back nine on Sunday was phenomenal. Is it enough? Yes! yes. It's amazing. Exhilarating. It's so, so clutch. Yes, sir! The greatest sporting events are the ones where you remember where you were when you saw it. We ran toward a man corner. I was right behind the 17th green. I'm holding on to the ladder with one hand and I'm shaking with the other hand. Our water broke at one point, just about the time Jack really started his charge. We stopped in West Virginia at a truck stop, stayed a lot longer than we thought we were going to stay. Crowds, the roar, the delight, the joy. Very few things in life are perfect. This was. All I keep reading in the papers is you just don't win the Masters at age 46. My gosh, I think they're wrong. So it's all over. It's his 16th major championship and his second of 1975. There was a time when the best golfer in the world was a guy named Jack William Nicholas. And of all the golf courses and all the tournaments where he offered proof of that fact, there may have been none that resonated more powerfully than his work at Augusta National in the Masters. But by the year 1986, that already felt like ancient history. Eleven springs had passed since the last of his five titles at Augusta. And besides, Jack was now 46 years old. Going into the week, was he a favorite? I would say no. Well, he hadn't won in two years. He had some tendonitis in his elbow. He wasn't even brought in the media center at Augusta that week. For years, the staple at Augusta on Wednesday was for Nicholas to come in and have a press conference. The tournament officials asked, do you want to have Jack to come in? And the president of the Golf Riders at that time, he said, no, he's not playing well. We don't want to embarrass him. Let's just, you know, not do it this year. Nicholas. And it's going to the right again. Sort of realized that probably around 41, 42 years old that I wasn't the guy to be, because I didn't prepare like I used to. In January, I'd start to think about Augusta, and i start to prepare myself for Augusta. Well, in 86, I probably thought about it in January, but didn't start preparing until March. Every year for the majors, you'd have to do a little charting the field box and pick your top 50. Tom McAllister wrote the story in the Journal-Constitution that week. He said he's done, he's gone, there's too much rust in his game, he can't play like that anymore, and he's too old to win the Masters. A good friend of ours, John Montgomery, who stayed with us every year, put a little article on the refrigerator. Of course, Jack never mentioned to John that he saw the article, but John knew he was seething. While the article gave him a bit of added motivation, there were other signs that something might be in the air. A whole bunch of little things happened. My mother came to the Masters, first time since 1959. My sister came to the Masters, first time since 1959. Called Barbara and Jack and I said, you know what, mom wants to come, she's 78. And I said, let's do it. I really believe having Jack as a caddy and the rest of the family there watching, I think was a great benefit. You've got this warmth of the family, and you tend to the conversations and the discussion uh, a little bit off of golf. We just had the best time. I mean, we rented a house, sat around the piano, and sang songs, and just had a wonderful time. But as the week began, Nicholas wasn't admitting to anyone that anything was going to help his cause. I said, you know, why are they coming down and wasting your time watching me play? Why are you wasting your time putting stuff on the refrigerator? I enjoyed having Jackie on the bag, but, you know, I, did, I figured I was done playing, so I'd have one of my kids caddy for me. You know, that kind of stuff. I mean, there wasn't any magic in that. 
Jack Nicholas may have known he wasn't the best golfer in the world anymore in 1986. As far as the magic goes, well, that's a whole nother story. Where were you when? It's the start of a question that's reserved for the most momentous events of our lives. Where were you when you met her or him? Where were you when you found out you were gonna be a mom or a dad? Where were you when you heard about something that changed the way you looked at the world forever? And for a lot of us, for sports fans, where were you when you saw a game or a team or a performance you knew you'd never forget? Where were you when Jack won? 30 years later, the answers can sometimes seem to mean as much as what actually happened. It was my third year of law school in the spring. We decided to go down to my buddy's condo. In 86, I was working in a discount golf shop, and this is where I'd worked in high school and college to help pay for school. I recall just being overjoyed to get the broadcast. You could still hear the CBS crew and faintly in the background talking with the German announcers on top of them. The noise from the room was getting louder and louder as people were unified in cheering Jack through that back nine. She started to get some contractions just about the time Jack really started to charge on the back nine. We were on our honeymoon in Hawaii. The flight was not even important. What Jack was doing was more important. Time came to close, and so we locked the doors, turned out the lights, and kept watching the golf. As Jack made his charge, more and more people came in until there was 15 to 20 people in here. It turned into almost a football game. And that's when I really got glued to this little wooden chair and this little TV in the middle of the night. Joan saying, you know, like, well, you know, I'm going to bed. And I said, no, you, you got to stay up now. Watch this is something special. We stopped in West Virginia at a truck stop. We weren't planning on staying very long. I said, hon, look, we could always catch another flight. I have to see the ending, and I have to see, you know, how Jack finishes. Her water broke at one point, and first time father, I'm all nervous. Should we go now? So it was her idea to stay. <laughs> I said, well, I'm not leaving until I find out who wins, because this is getting too close. When we uh, found the driver's lounge, there was about four or five truckers in there watching a race. We asked politely if we could just change the channel. Unfortunately for them, we never went back to the auto race. I think they understood that their day of watching what they wanted to watch was over with. Well, he just keeps making pot after pot, and even though the store had closed, the phone started ringing, and everybody was asking the same question, do you have that putter? That was our first yep. bath. Went to the hospital at 7.30 in the evening, and then at 12.33, Caitlin was born. For me, it was a sense of motivation and inspiration, really, that you can actually achieve things if the stars are aligned on that particular day. There's very strong and real memories. That has got to mean that it made an impression. There is no doubt in the wide world that it made an impression. While the 86 Masters would eventually leave an impression around the globe, heading into the tournament, it was the players from all over the world who were making the biggest imprint on the game. Never in doubt. Coming into 1986, uh, the European invasion was in full force. You know, the world golf rankings had just come out for the first time that week. And at the top of that was the defending Masters champion, Bernhard Langer. Right behind him was Seve Ballesteros, who had won the Masters twice. And then number three was Sandy Lyle, who was the reigning British Open champion. And to top that off, the, the Europeans had won the Ryder Cup for the first time in nearly 30 years the previous fall. Europe's win at the 85 Ryder Cup at the Belfry. It felt like the final piece of an international transformation of the sport that had slowly been underway for generations. At mid-century, there'd been Bobby Locke and Peter Thompson. Then Gary Player and Tony Jacklin. 
And as the 80s dawned, England's Nick Faldo, Scotland's Sandy Lyle, Germany's Bernhard Longer, Australia's Greg Norman. And in 1986, there was no question that the face of international golf was Spain's Severiano Ballesteros. He played golf differently. He painted with the big brush and threw the bright colors up there. He's buttoned up as so many guys are now in the way they play and everything is routine and everything is calibrated to the nth degree. I mean, Sammy just went out and played. He's hit that well. It's me. That's it. There was no, no fair, no tactics, uh, no game plan on the, on the court, nothing. It was just... Uh, my philosophy just, uh, was just to hold out as, as quick as possible. He was something special. He could change the weather with his face. He would be thunderously blue, almost with rage. And then when he smiled, he was beautiful. It's like the sun came out. Uh, it, it, he was a force to be reckoned with. But as the 1986 Masters approached, even bigger forces led Ballesteros to head to tiny Lake City, Florida for the little-known Florida Cup Classic, an event run by the Tournament Players Association. The Spaniard had been suspended by the PGA Tour for not playing enough events in 1985 and was feuding with the Tour's leadership. In Lake City, he'd finished 22nd, but by the time he got to Augusta, it was an anguish of a very different sort that made his pursuit of a third green jacket an urgent one. That was the promise that I, I, I said to my father, well, I'm going to take you to the Masters and I'm going to win for you. And uh, obviously uh, he passed away in early March. It was very tough. He passed me the strength to play and compete in the Masters very strong. And through three rounds at Augusta National, Ballesteros looked as strong as ever. The way that he was playing and the way the determination that you saw in Seve's eyes, I didn't think anyone was going to catch him. But in fact, a collection of other international stars were alongside him on the leaderboard. Zimbabwe's Nick Price fired a course record 63 on Saturday, breaking Nicholas's mark with a putt for a 62, which would have been an all-time low in a major, lipping out at 18. Price joined Ballesteros and defending champion Longer at 5-under overall, which was one shot back of the leader, Norman, and play concluded Saturday night. But lurking just behind Jack was a familiar face. Pitching wedge from 116 yards. And a marvelous shot. I was four shots back, and uh, only eight, for eight players in front of me. And Jack finishes minus two. Well, I think if you're four shots back and you got 20 guys in front of you, you got 20 guys to pass. There are four shots in front of you, and, and you only got eight guys. Only one or two of them have to slip, and you shoot a good round, and you're right there. So Nicholas felt like he had a shot going into Sunday afternoon and spent Saturday night in the same place he'd spent every other night that week, in the trainer's room. You come in and just stick his head and say, hey, Paul, I've got to do this, this, and here's my schedule. Um, I'm, I'm going to finish at uh, 4.07, and I'll be there at uh, 4.33. And he'd be there at 4.33. That Saturday night before the final round, and uh, you know, I had the opportunity to have my father there that week, and Jackie came in with him. So it was just my dad and, and Jackie and, and Jack and myself. Jack was on the treatment table and, and started, as I'm working on his neck, started to literally tell me you know, shot by shot, you know, visual, visualized it, said it out loud, you know, exactly where he needed to position each shot, what, what score he needed that could win by one. After Jack's treatment, I said, Jack, do you mind taking a picture with my dad? Oh, sure, no problem. Jackie took the picture, and my dad, he said that week was absolutely his favorite week of his life. It's a prized possession. Like yours or mine, the Nicholas family has no shortage of memories. Even Jack said he's never heard anything like this. But Sunday, April 13th, 1986, was a whole different kind of unforgettable. 
was at the University of Georgia. Athens is maybe two hours from Augusta. I had uh, two of my best friends over at the house, and we were getting ready to go scuba diving. I was out on the boat, water sports, kneeboarding with some friends. I had a bunch of friends at SMU, and they said, you know, you got to come out for the weekend. My mom asked to go to see one more Masters. We got the boys and my mom, and we drove down. She really watched this tournament. You know, she'd made up her mind she was going to see it. I was excited. It was turning 19 and talked about going, and yeah. it was the best 19th birthday, <laughs> uh, you know, you could ever have. In my lifetime, I have never heard, and may never hear again, uh, that kind of human electricity was just, it was mm -hmm. in infectious. When we heard what was going on, we went to a friend's house, a bunch of 12-year-old kids sitting there watching the tournament, and we, we really couldn't take our eyes off of it. Makes a putt at nine. I was like, okay, well, Lou, let's wait and watch 10. So then he makes the putt at 10. It's like, Lou, let's go put the boat up. It was a big regret, but what are you going to do? I watched it in Dallas. <laughs> One of the things about Sunday at Augusta is that every shot is remembered, especially on the back nine, because everybody's so familiar with the golf course. And so what happens at Augusta is more burned into the collective memory than any other Sunday of major championship golf. The stars people were expecting to remember on that Sunday in 1986 were headlined by Greg Norman, atop the leaderboard by one, over a group that included Ballesteros, Longer, and Price. Meanwhile, sitting four shots back of Norman, tied for ninth, was a five-time Masters winner, even if no one really seemed to notice. The golfers will immediately tell I don't remember one of our announcers saying, keep an eye on Jack when Sunday began. Sunday morning of the tournament, Steve calls me, he says, what do you think, Pops? And we just talked about what it might take to win the golf tournament, and you know, we talked about the score, and he said, well, I said, I think 66 will tie 65 will win. He says, exact number I had in mind, go shoot it. Jack might have had some expectations of possibly winning. You would never think when we started that things would turn around the way they did. I started out, and I really felt good about the way I was playing, and nothing happened. A lot of people weren't, weren't sticking around after the first six or seven holes because he really wasn't doing much. Though the crowd around Nicholas shrunk, on the ninth green, those who stuck around got to see the start of the surge. They just had to wait a bit. I think that really the first time that we began to think we may have something going here was on the eighth and ninth holes. So I got to nine, and I was even par for the round, which obviously wasn't very good. I was up at the green. Jack addressed the ball. He had about a 12-foot, and it was a slick putt. I'm getting ready to hit my putt, and all of a sudden, a big roar goes up at eight. Uh, Bias Theris hold his third shot. As he addressed the ball again, another roar went off. Tom Kite right behind him hold a wedge. And he looked at the gallery, and he said, well, let's see what we can do here. See if we can make some noise here. The crowd kind of cheered him and said, yeah, that's a great idea. Well, welcome back to Augusta, everybody. And let's go hit the five line as hard as you can and just let your buddy just do all the work. I definitely screwed up in that situation. I don't think Norman was ever the same on that golf course after that particular shot. I I'm still amazed at what he did on that. Norman got the chip to within 12 feet of the hole, and only a par putt stood between Jack Nicholas and perhaps golf's greatest victory. Jack Nicholas has just won his sixth Masters. The security guys who were outside of the Butler camp and got so excited and it was so sweet to see the people who were so happy for Jack. Rouse the roar, the delight, the joy. <laughs> Probably the greatest thing I've ever seen. It was just it was fantastic. The people were fantastic and uh, all I keep reading in the papers is you just don't win the Masters at age 46. And my gosh, I think they're wrong. Among the millions of fans captivated by the win was a group at a golf club manufacturing company down the state highway in Albany, Georgia. 
We shipped about 150,000 that year, but that was all we could make. It really kind of saved McGregor Golf Company. And then there was a family back in Ohio, overcome by the significance of what they'd seen. I can see them. It's just all so real and such a part of our lives. Coming down the stretch today was an experience I'll never forget. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You were terrific. Thank you. When I think back on the 86 Masters and what Jack accomplished at age 46, certainly in my lifetime, the greatest accomplishment uh, in golf. I get asked a lot, what is your favorite? My fallback position for 30 years has always been Nicholas on the back nine at Augusta in April of 86. That's my favorite sporting event ever. That would rank near the very, very top, okay? Sitting there with Jack Nicholas getting his green jacket. The crowd's going crazy. I turned around and there's my dad. It should have been all about my dad, yet he made that moment about me. She got her wish, and boy, did he answer it for her. <laughs> I made those clubs, you know? And whenever he won, I felt like I was part of that. One of the greatest moments of my life to see him win that tournament. Where were you when? It's a question that can only be asked about a very small collection of moments. But that's what makes the answers so meaningful. Wherever you were, who you were, whether you can say you helped make it happen or simply just watched it happen, this tournament, this win, this moment was never just about him because it belonged and still belongs to all of us.